they saw him afar off, and before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. They said to one another, here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we shall say that a wild beast has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. The they in these sentences are Joseph's brothers, and the him and the dreamer is Joseph. The passage is from Genesis 37, one of the Old Testament readings for our church services in August. It's a dramatic moment in the story. Joseph has been sent by his father, Jacob, to check on the 10 of his sons who were tending the flocks in a distant pasture land. When he gets there, eight of his brothers want to kill him. One of them wants to restore Joseph to his father, and one wants actually not to kill him, but to sell him to slavery in Egypt, which is about the same as being dead. So what happens to this young man? Is he thrown into the pit and die there? Or does one, the one brother who want to save him rescue him? Or does the one brother who wants to get rid of him by selling him into slavery get his way? What happens next? I'm asking these somewhat rhetorical questions since I'm sure that you know the answers to all of them to suggest that this is a very good story. We tend to forget that in our way of dealing with the Bible that it contains some of the best stories in the world. And the story of Joseph and his brothers is one of them. I'm Grant Voth, and I used to teach some of these stories in my world literature classes as literature, not as religious instruction or theology, but as just darn good stories. They deal with people who, like us, have decisions to make and actions to take, and who have to live with the consequences of their choices. In this and the next blog, I'd like to take you through the story of Joseph and his brothers, as we used to do in my classes not as a reinforcement of already held beliefs or even very much concerned with its truth value, but just as a story. So let's see what we can do. The first thing we notice about this story is that like so many Old Testament families, Jacob's family is rife with passion and struggle and hostility and even violence. The first 36 chapters of Genesis are full of stories of this kind of family. Cain kills his brother Abel. Noah curses his son Ham. Abraham drives his handmaid Hagar and his son Ishmael into the wilderness. And Jacob and his mother trick Isaac into giving a blessing, the birthright blessing to the wrong son, to Jacob instead of to Esau. And then Jacob has to run for his life when the trick is discovered. Family life is not very tranquil in these stories. In this one, Jacob causes most of the trouble in his family by playing favorites. One of the first things we're told is that Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his children because he was a son of his old age. That's a plausible explanation, but if we know Jacob's earlier history, we remember that he wanted to marry Rachel, the younger daughter of his uncle Laban, and he worked seven years as an indentured servant to win her, only to be tricked on his wedding night into marrying Leah, the older sister. He had to work another seven years for Rachel, the woman he really loved. Jacob's other 10 sons are from Leah and two handmaids, but Rachel in Jacob's later years gave him Joseph and Benjamin, and whom, though he winds up loving them in a way that he never does his other sons, because they are the children of his true wife, the one he really loved. The other 10 sons know this too, and they know why Jacob loves Joseph more, but it probably doesn't make them feel any better about watching Joseph get all the family privileges while they do all the work. The text tells us that when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. The special sign of Jacob's favoritism is the coat of many colors he gives to Joseph. We don't know exactly what that coat would have looked like, but it's a big deal. It's a sign of status. It's a way of showing that the wearer is a really important person. And when we first meet Joseph in the story, we recognize him as a pampered child, as a spoiled child. He brings ill report of 
all that his brothers are doing. That is, every time the brothers do something wrong, he goes home and tells his dad about it. And he insists on sharing his dreams with his brothers, dreams in which his, which their 11 sheaves bow to his one sheaf, or 11 stars and the sun and moon bow down to him, implying that one day he will be their, their he will rule over them. His brothers already don't like him, and these dreams he tells them about make them hate him even more. Still, we don't recognize precisely how much they hate him until he's sent by his father to check up on his brothers who are tending the flocks at some distance from home. When they see him coming toward them in his magnificent coat, of course, they actually decide to kill him. They really don't like Joseph at all. At this point, two brothers step forward to try to ameliorate things a bit. Reuben says to throw him in a pit, and the narrator tells us that Reuben wants later on to come back and rescue Joseph from the pit and then restore him to his father. And Judah says they really shouldn't shed a brother's blood, so why don't they sell him, simply sell him into slavery, which has uh, some cash value as well. Both Reuben and Judah have good reasons for their suggestions that have nothing to do with caring for Joseph. Reuben is in Jacob's doghouse. <laughs> we don't have time to go into all of the details, but if you want to know why Reuben is in such disgrace with Jacob and why he needs to win back his father's approval, read Genesis chapter 35 about the time that Reuben more or less rapes Bilhah, one of Jacob's handmaids and the mother of two of Jacob's sons. Judah, on the other hand, is angling for top spot in line for the family blessing, or birthright. That is becoming the special bearer of Yahweh's promise to Abraham and then passed on to Isaac and Jacob, the promise of becoming the father of a great nation. Reuben is the oldest, and so technically he should get that blessing. But Jacob, because of the Bilha event, has good reason to think that Reuben can't be the bearer of this special blessing. Sibion and Levi, the next two sons in the birth order, are also in trouble with their father for the stuff they did in the really bloody story about Dinah and the men of Shechem in chapter 34. Both chapters, by the way, make for some racy and exciting reading. All of his sons know that Jacob wasn't the elder son, and so technically he isn't the one who should have received that blessing. But he did, so that being the oldest boy itself isn't enough. So Judah figures that with Reuben, Simeon, and Levi out of the running, he will be in line for the blessing if he can just get Joseph, Jacob's favorite son, out of the way, but without actually killing him, which he's reluctant to do, unlike the other eight who seem satisfied with having Joseph die in the pit. Judah's plan more or less works. A bunch of Midianite merchants find Joseph in his pit and sell him to some Ishmaelite merchants on their way to Egypt. The Midianites get the money, but the brothers get rid of Joseph without actually having to kill him. The brothers then go ahead and stain Joseph's coat of many colors with a blood of a goat and show it to their father, who assumes that Joseph has been eaten by a wild beast. That's the end of Joseph as far as Jacob concerned, and he's heartbroken. We know, however, that Joseph is still alive and that the story follows him to Egypt, where he turns out to be the kind of young man that we wouldn't have predicted from his earlier appearances. Thomas Mann, in his novel, Joseph and His Brothers, guesses that experiencing the full extent of his brother's hatred of him, realizing they hate him enough to kill him, and then spending time in a pit thinking that he was going to die, forced Joseph into some real soul searching which accounts for why he seems so much more grown up when he gets to Egypt. Potiphar buys him and very soon recognizes, recognizes something special in his new slave, some strength of character and some real gifts. He hands over more and more of the running of his estate to Joseph until he turns everything over to this extraordinary 17-year-old slave. We're also told that Joseph was a goodly person and well-favored, which Potiphar's wife notices too. The episode in which she tries to seduce him is really nicely done. In our text, she simply says to him, lie with me. 
well, she must have said more than that, and there has to be more to the story than this. But the abruptness and the imperative nature of her sentence suggests both the desire that's grown in her from watching this good-looking, amazing young man around the house, and maybe reminds us that after all, he is a slave who is expected to do whatever he's told. He escapes from her, but as he's leaving, she grabs his garment and later uses it to convince the other slaves and her husband that, Jace, jo that Joseph attempted to rape her, her revenge on him for refusing her offer. And so Joseph winds up in jail, which is pretty much rock bottom for an Old Testament slave, uh, a, a total Old Testament hero, a slave wasting away in a foreign prison. We could guess from the fact that he's imprisoned rather than executed, which Potiphar could have done, that Potiphar cared enough for Joseph to soften the punishment as much as he could. The jailer very quickly recognizes the same things that Joseph that Potiphar did, and before long, Joseph is actually running the prison. There's something about this young slave that everyone recognizes as extraordinary. And in addition, he has a gift for dreaming and interpreting dreams. All ancient peoples, including the Jews and probably most of our ancestors, believe that dreams come from outside ourselves as messages from God or the gods, or more dangerously, from a demon or an evil spirit trying to destroy us. Most children still think that dreams come from outside them. A woman I taught with for many years told me that her sons, when they were little, asked her every night to pull down the shades and draw the curtains to keep the dreams out. It's one of the great disillusionments of history that Freud taught us that our dreams not, don't come from outside, but from inside. They aren't messages, but distorted mirror images of ourselves. But this story is pre-Freudian, and Joseph and the narrator of the story clearly believe that in dreams, Yahweh is speaking to Joseph, who always says that both dreams and their interpretation come from God. So, he has these dreams of sovereignty over his brothers to hold on to, no matter how bad things look at the moment. And this gift also allows him to interpret correctly the dreams of Pharaoh's chief butler and chief baker, who are sharing prison time with Joseph. You could read in chapter 40 of Genesis what happens. He tells the butler, who's going to be restored to favor, according to his dream, to remember to tell Pharaoh about Pharaoh about this young man in prison who got his dreams right. But like most people, the butler is so happy to be restored that he forgets all about Joseph and two more long years have to pass before Joseph's gift is needed again. When that happens, Pharaoh has two dreams that none of his dream analysts can interpret and the butler finally remembers the young man in prison who's good at dreams. And then Joseph is called to the throne room. He interprets the dream, or actually two dreams, which Joseph says are really the same dream. Amazed and stunned both by the dream interpretation and by the young man himself, Pharaoh makes Joseph secretary of agriculture, somehow recognizing in him the qualities that had led Potiphar and the jailer to turn over all their responsibilities to him. Joseph is to collect food during the seven years of plenty that Pharaoh's dream predicted, and then distribute it during the seven years of famine that follow. At this point, Joseph's story is a stunning and amazing success. Like Horatio Alger, he's risen not once, but twice from being misunderstood and undervalued and thrown into a pit and sold into slavery and imprisoned for something that he didn't do, to being recognized for the extraordinary good young man that he is, and one with a gift for dreams. If this were just Joseph's story, and it was a story only about Joseph, it could end here. But this isn't the whole story, and even his part of it has a long ways to go. What follows is a story that's told over and over in the Old Testament, the story of how Yahweh chooses one person, sometimes not a very likely one, to save his people. Joseph still has a long way to go and much to learn, as do we, as we read the rest of the story. We get to all of that next time. So please, before the next blog, 
if you have a chance, read the story of Joseph, which is chapters 37 to 44 in Genesis. You could skip chapter 38 unless you want an interesting side story about Judah. And then come back to hear some of the reasons why this has been called the best short story in the Old Testament.